Hi, this is Jurgen Rasmussen. Welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis Vlog. This one is about a few tips on how I work with stuttering. This can be a very rewarding uh, area to work with, and relatively few people have a lot of experience in working with stuttering. I uh, saw my first stutterer probably around 15 years ago or so, and have seen them somewhat regularly uh, as a client group since then. And as a result, I've been able to notice some patterns, make some observations in terms of how to use with these folks, uh, how to work with these folks in a way that's effective. I'm not going to share the specific details so much about how I work. That would be way too comprehensive uh, for a <clears throat> quick video blog. But what I would like to do is to give you a framework, some overarching principles, things to look out for in terms of how to work with people who stutter. <coughs> so first of all, one thing that I've noticed is that you can put stutterers in a continuum in terms of belief. On the one hand, you have the people who insist upon stuttering as a disease or something purely mechanical or, in quotation marks, physical. And on the other hand, you have the people who think of it more in psychological terms. Now, the people who think of it more in psychological terms are way easier to help. So whatever you can do to help the client make discoveries in terms of this being a, a psychosomatic or a psychologically generated phenomena, the easier it will be to help the person. <clears throat> so a couple of things to, no to, to know. Uh, as far as I know, having read quite a bit of literature on the topic, there is no brain pathology associated with stuttering. There is nothing about a stutterer's brain per se <clears throat> that, that shows any abnormality or, or deficiency or, or cell pathology. So everything points in the direction of stuttering not being a neurological disease, uh, that there's nothing wrong with the brain of the stutterer, uh, so to speak. Uh, quite a few people, I can't quite remember the percentages, I think it's somewhere around 10% of kids, uh, stutter a little bit, you know, during childhood as they learn language. Almost all of them just grow out of it. And then you have maybe 1% of people who, who keep doing the habit. <clears throat> Now, in working with stutterers, there's, there's a couple of, there's three things that I've noticed that are really important. Uh, a, I've never met a stutterer or a person who stutters who always stutters. And this is something to ask the person and to inquire, you know, when do you stutter? When don't you stutter? And what, you, what you'll discover is that stuttering is very often very context specific, meaning that they might stutter in some specific context and situations and not others. If that's the case, it's relatively easy to then guide the person in the direction of discovering, making the connection that this has to do something with, with the, the mind states that they're in in the moment. Um, they might stutter around some people and not other people. Again, you can help them make the same discovery that there, there's nothing about another human being that can make them stutter. It has to be, it has to have something to do with how they construe the other person and the, the specific state that they're in in the moment. They may also talk about good or bad periods, and, and they may also talk about specific states such as anxiety or excitement as states where they have a tendency to stutter. So some people are not very psychologically oriented, 
And it's important to have this conversation so that you can kind of nudge them to make the connection and see that, that look, uh, these are different contexts or different situations. Your, your state is different. Your expectations are different. Your memories are different. Uh, the, 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 the thought projections you have going on are different, so, so you have different experiences. They will also very often report that they stutter on some words or some letters and not others. And they generally believe that there's something about the word or the letters or combinations of letters in them themselves that makes them stutter. This again is not true. Uh, there's no letter or word that can make you stutter. It's, it's just the fact that people expect to stutter on certain words. They think they're going to do it and then they do it and then they credit the word. So you, you want to have a conversation with them in terms of when, so you can like clearly differentiate the context. Um, there's a question that I, that I always ask stutterers, and there's only one person who's ever given me a different answer. So I ask them, if you were alone, talking out loud to yourself or if you were with a you know infant or if you were talking to a dog or a cat and there was no other human being around you who could understand you or hear you would you stutter and with one exception the answer has always been no i'll say the question again if you were alone talking out loud to yourself or if you were speaking to an infant a small child a, a dog or a cat and there was no one around who could hear you understand you would you still stutter again with just one exception uh people have, have always said no when they say no to this you can then look at them with some expectancy and say look if that's the case that means that the stuttering has everything to do with your expectancies and the thoughts and feelings you have around expressing yourself in relation to other people. It has everything to do with your expectancies, thoughts and feelings around expressing yourself in relation to other people. That's what we're going to work on. This is the frame that you want to enforce. This is, this is where you want to, to work because if they, if they can speak fluently in those contexts, that means that they can speak fluently. It, it means that they already know how to do it. This is one of my objections to how a lot of um, speech therapists work. You know, they focus on very mechanical stuff. But, but, but the truth is that these folks know how to speak fluently. They just don't do it. And th there's an anxiety, there, there, there's a thought process that kind of gets in the way. Now, a, a third thing <clears throat> that you'll notice is that when people speak fluently, they breathe. When people stutter, they hold their breath. I'll say it again. When people speak fluently, they breathe. They speak on the outbreath. When people stutter, they always, without exception, stop breathing. So they have two different breathing patterns going on. So in the office, <coughs> if they speak to you, as, as soon as they as soon as they stutter, you can go, Ah, did you notice that? What did you notice? Like point to their physiology. And they'll usually say, oh, my, my shoulder's kind of hunched over. You know, I have this tension in my, in, in my um, uh, sternum or, or chest or uh, constriction in the throat. And you can invite them to notice that they actually stop breathing. The trick is, if they breathe, they speak. If they hold their breath, they'll stutter. So what I'll usually do is I'll, I'll put them on the floor and I'll, I'll, I'll have them put, a, put a, a big book on their belly and I have them do slow breathing. And then after a while, so that they, when they breathe in, 
they press the book out with their tummy, and when they breathe out, they let the book kind of press their tummy or stomach down. So I teach them to breathe very rhythmically, using their their stomach uh, to do so. And then after a while, I'll have them repeat simple words and sentences as they breathe, as the book is kind of forcing their their out breath. And lo and behold, they always, without exception, notice that when they do that, they don't stutter. They actually speak fluently. This is often a shock for many of them. And you know, many of these folks view themselves as stutterers. It's, it, it's like an, an identity topic. But, but you, can, you can then very easily, when they make the discovery, when they're in that kind of insight type of frame where they go, oh shit, you can go, it's not who you are. It's just two different patterns of breathing. It's not who you are. It's just two different patterns of breathing. When you don't breathe, you stutter. When you breathe, you speak fluently. You're still the same human being. None of this touches your essence as a human being. Then I train them with using their hand to kind of pump the breathing. And then I teach them to just remember the feeling of the hand on their stomach while they do it. And then I teach them to move around and do the breathing. So we'll, we'll, we'll add more and more distractions, you know, keeping it, keeping it fluent. Something else I will do is to use anchoring so that I task them with that every time they stop breathing, they are to put their hand, you know, on their throat or on their chest where they feel the constriction, just to remind their brain that, okay, right now I'm here, I stop breathing. Then they put their hand on their belly, breathe in, breathe out, and then say the words that they wanted to say. Now, by anchoring this, by, by tasking them with using their hand as an anchor for two different breathing patterns, you're linking uh, their, their stuttering habit so that every time they start doing it, you're, you're creating a, an anchor chain where they're automatically doing the rhythmic breathing. This is a very nice way to, to kind of unhook or, or unroot uh, uh, the stuttering habit uh, using anchors. Um, for those of you who have trained with me in, in the psychological illusion model, where, where we look for, you know, threats and, you know, self-concepts and stuff like that, uh, you, you, you can look for the drive or, or the command or the compulsion to stutter. People often have this felt sense that there are certain words and there are certain sentences that kind of make them stutter. And you can, you can, you can help them look for the compulsion and discover that it's not really there when they look. You, you can also have them make the discovery by using your hand on their stomach or using the book have them do the rhythmic breathing and do those very words or sentences and they discover that as long as they breathe properly it doesn't matter which letters or which words they're pronouncing this is often a big aha and you want to make sure that you're there with them helping them to actually make those connections it's really important to do real life testing i usually take them to stores I, I usually have them visit people. You know, it's 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 really important to get them out there and to to, to, to get them to practice. Um, and you know, a lot of times people who stutter uh, are remarkably low when it comes to self reflection and self insight. Uh, they're often poor at describing their internal experience or, or having much reflection inwards. Uh, this is just a theory on my part, but I, I I suspect that it has something to do with not having talked a lot with other people or used a lot of time attempting to describe their own internal experience. So teaching them to meditate, teaching them mindfulness, t teaching them to, to make distinctions and to be able to connect with their own internal experience uh, is very important. And, and many of them have... Um, 
self-concepts of being weak or insecure, uh, stuff like that as a result of the stuttering. So you, you, you can either help them discover that the self that's weak or the stutterer that they think they are is nowhere to be found uh, by doing various forms of self-inquiry if you know how to do that stuff. Or you could also go the Albert Ellis type routes, the REBT route, and teach them about unconditional self-acceptance, meaning teaching them to rate their behaviors and their performances, but, but to not globally rate their, their self, to, to practice unconditional uh, self-acceptance. Uh, a final thing that's very often useful is, you know, people who stutter are, are often so, uh, since everyone is at the center of their own universe, they're so often so obsessed with the stuttering and they judge themselves so harshly for the stuttering that they then very often automatically project onto other people that other people are very... Um, give their stuttering a lot of meaning and a lot of attention and judge them really harshly. So you, you can teach them some some basic psychology about the fundamental attribution error, for example, and, and, and help them kind of discover that, that uh, they are way less visible to other people than they think, and, and that the motives that they attribute to other people are, are largely incorrect to help them see the, uh, the impersonal nature of it. Uh, I'll leave you with this. Uh, to get long-term solid results with stuttering can be a little bit difficult. It's, it's usually rougher to work with stuttering than it is a regular phobia or anxiety. So, so be prepared to, to do work and be, be prepared to, to have a commitment with your client to, to uh, you know, stay in the game uh, until it's done. That is super, super important. So I, I hope this was useful. Um, if, if you want to work with me, you know, as a client, uh, host me for a seminar or, or have me as your mentor, you know, go to provocativehypnosis.com, send me an email, uh, get in touch. Okay, thanks.